You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston in West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 8, The Rise of Mussolini, Part 2, The March on Rome. This week, a big thank you goes out to Diane and Carl for choosing to support this podcast on Patreon, where they now get access to special ad-free versions of all of these episodes, plus special Patreon-only episodes released once a month. This month's episode is on the evolution of the Imperial Japanese Navy from its founding until the Washington Naval Conference in 1921. If that sounds interesting to you, head on over to historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members to find out more information. I would also like to remind everyone that for every episode of the podcast, I post a full transcript and a sources list for it, over on historyofthesecondworldwar.com, so if that information might interest you, you can head on over there for every episode to check it out. As we discussed in detail last week, a generic definition for fascism is difficult to determine, or as Aristotle Callus would say in Fascist Ideology, Territory and Expansionism in Italy and Germany, 1922-1945, quote, Attempts to devise a generic ideological minimum of fascism have stumbled upon two major objections. On the one hand, a number of historians have categorically rejected the notion that a specific fascist value system underpinned the decisions and actions of the fascist movements and regimes. On the other hand, even amongst those who accept the ontological value of fascist ideas, there is widespread skepticism about the validity and utility of a generic model of fascist ideology. End quote. Because of this difficulty, the best way to discuss fascism is to look at the events and actions of specific fascist movements. Today, we will begin by discussing the growth of the Italian fascist party in the years immediately following the First World War. At this time, they were a party that was trying to establish themselves on the Italian political landscape. We will then continue our discussion into the March on Rome, the event that would catapult Mussolini to the position of Italian Prime Minister in 1922. The March on Rome, and then the events immediately following it, would be pretty much the defining moment for Italian fascism, and so it's important that we look at it and discuss it and talk about some of its ramifications. The roots of the Italian fascist party that would come to power in 1922 were based in the First World War. Italy had entered the First World War after signing the Treaty of London with the Entente, made up of the British Empire and France. Now, in that treaty, Italy was promised large territorial expansion opportunities should the Entente be victorious in the conflict. This included areas to the north of Italy's borders, territories across the Adriatic in Dalmatia, a set of Peloponnesian islands, and even lands as far away as Asia Minor. Now, few of these territories would actually be given over to Italy during the Paris Peace Conference, mostly because many of them conflicted with other guarantees made to other nations that had brought them into the war. The failure of the Italian government to make good on these clauses caused great disappointment among many in Italy, with the term, quote, mutilated victory being used to describe what had occurred at the Paris Peace Conference. Now, this caused many groups within Italy to come to the belief that Italy's participation in the war had not been worth it, a feeling that was just amplified by the economic and societal strains of the three-year-long conflict. Many also felt that the sacrifices made by Italy and the Italian people were not borne equally by all of the nation, which was mostly accurate. While some in Italy were reduced by the war to absolute destitution and poverty, Others would profit greatly from Italy's war efforts. This caused anger and frustration to grow among those in the lower classes, the workers, both urban and rural. A large number of those most frustrated by the war and its outcomes were, unsurprisingly, the war veterans who had fought in the Italian army during the war. All of these disgruntled individuals, veterans or not, 
would find ways to vent their frustration. For some, they would turn to the political groups on the left, and the Italian Socialist and Communist parties would see a rapid increase in support. Many others would choose the opposite path and instead put their support behind political parties on the right, including the Italian Fascist Party. The Italian Fascist Party did not begin life as a radical right-wing political party. Instead, coming into 1919, many of its policies were considered to be very leftist at the time. During those early years, they would support workers' rights, including support for an eight-hour workday. Along with supporting these types of changes, the fascists were also supported during this period by the syndicalists, a group that would be important early supporters of the Italian fascist movement. Syndicalism is the belief that unions and workers' associations are the best way to break the power of the upper classes. Italian syndicalism had, would split during the First World War into two groups, one that opposed the war and would later support the socialists, and those that supported the war, the future national syndicalists who would support fascism. The philosophical difference between the two groups was in how they viewed the relationship between the workers and the unions, or, or syndicates. National syndicalists saw the syndicates as a way to control the workers, to put them under the control of the state. Non-fascist syndicalists saw the syndicates as controlled by the workers and for the workers. The national syndicalists would support Mussolini and would mix their beliefs with strong Italian nationalism, a mixture that would result in a belief structure that rejected democracy and Marxism while embracing violence, a set of values that precisely mimicked those of the fascists. It would be during 1920 that the Italian fascist party would make the conscious choice to adopt some policies which would coincide with a strong move away from workers' rights and other leftist policies and towards the right. Now this was done in the belief that the party could gain greater support both among the people just and just as importantly financially from business leaders and other conservative individuals. During this period of transition for the Italian fascists, the Italian socialists were a party that was growing in support very rapidly, especially in the northern areas of the country, but was also one that was quite disjointed. Many of its leaders were unconvinced that a true socialist revolution would be allowed to succeed by the Western powers. However, they also could not fully push those within the movement to a moderate position in line with their own beliefs. And so what would develop was a system where the local socialist groups were the most radical parts of the movement. But due to the lack of support for such drastic changes from above, they were also very disjointed in their actions. This would eventually lead to the socialists and, and the communists splitting apart in Italy. The fascists often did not have the same level of disorganization, and they would meet the increasing strength and size of socialism with an increase in the frequency and severity of violence that they meted out. During these immediate post-war years, the active supporters of fascism were often very young, a feature of the movement during the early 1920s. Even at the top of the movement, few of the leaders were over 50. For example, Mussolini would be just 39 when he became prime minister in 1922. Many of the fascist party's members had fought in the war, which meant that they were under the age of roughly 40. And many of these soldiers were unmarried. They'd been thrust into military service before establishing a career, and had little prospects for starting a life in the war-wrecked Italian economy. They would also primarily be urban dwellers. This was partially due to Mussolini and other fascist leaders believing that it was only in the cities that fascism could thrive which ended up being a self-fulfilling prophecy in the early years of the movement. They did not put resources into rural areas for recruitment, and so fascism's reach in those communities would be small. Later, when more resources were allocated to rural areas, fascist support among the rural population would prove to be quite strong. The party would make a decisive change in their path at the National Fascist Conference that was held in Rome during November 1921. The conference would be the venue for two important changes for the Italian fascist movement. The first was that it would more firmly establish central control of local fascist groups that had previously been somewhat autonomous. This involved a much firmer control from the very top, with a pledge of fealty to Mussolini being a new part of membership within the party. The second important change was that the Congress would be the point where the Italian fascists would totally move away from their socialist policies of the previous years. Or, as Mussolini himself would say, In terms of economics, we are overtly anti-socialists, 
I do not regret having been a socialist, but I have cut my bridges with the past. I have no nostalgia. I don't think about entering socialism, but rather about leaving it. In economic matters, we are liberals because we believe that the national economy cannot be entrusted to collective entities or to the bureaucracy. End quote. At the Congress, they would also make other policy changes, like a direct rejection of feminism and of female activism within the party. Instead, female fascists should wholly focus on organizing charity, and in all political matters, they should defer to their male counterparts. The fascists would also exit the Congress in support of the monarchy, whereas before they had supported Italian republicanism. The 1921 Congress would be an important step towards turning fascism from a slightly disorganized movement into a political group within Italy that was united enough and had a platform palatable enough to the right audience to allow Italian fascism to move closer to power. Hello, Saver! Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Some of these decisions would cause conflict within the movement, and especially between some of the fascist leaders and their most ardent and radical supporters, those who would form the squads that took the violent rhetoric of fascism and turned it into violent reality. The squadristi were often made up of military veterans, and they did not need too much encouragement to take their actions to the streets. This was a positive attribute before 1921, but would make it harder to control local groups in later years. For example, in the port city of Trieste, all it took was one suggestion from Mussolini to unleash a wave of violence against socialists and non-Italians within the city. As the paramilitary arm of Italian fascism, the squadristi gave the movement a certain force of action, but they were not the answer to all of its problems. They would at times fail to achieve their goals. For example, the failures of the paramilitary occupation of Fiume uh, on the Adriatic was a critical early stumbling block that would alter the view of Mussolini and others. It was in that city that the fascists attempted to take control in March 1922, only to then be met by actions of the Italian government that would restore command of the city back to Fiume officials. The failure of the Fiume occupation would be one reason that Mussolini would choose to pursue a slightly more constitutional path to power, a decision that would eventually put him at odds with the squadristi. On the complete opposite end of the activism spectrum, but just as important to Italian fascism, was the support of many within the political, economic, and military classes. From the political elite, fascists gained support due to the belief that fascists were preferable to any of the parties on the left. From the economic realm, fascist support was once again rooted in fear of the left, and especially the effect that socialist and communist political movements had on the workers. The growing strength of the Italian fascists appeared to be the perfect counterweight to the organization and powers of workers which had drastically increased since the war. Finally, the military would make their widespread sympathies for fascism well known by 1922. This would create a certain amount of doubt that the military could be counted on to come down against fascism if it was called upon to do so by the government. Each of these avenues of support provided a form of legitimacy to the fascists, but it also provided them with a freedom of action that was denied to their political enemies. An example of this can be seen in the action of local political leaders who were put in a very tough position as violence continued to increase in the early 1920s. The official position of the national government was that any groups that caused violence should be arrested and dealt with through legal means. Sounds good. However, Due to the widespread support, or at the very least acceptance, of fascist violence among much of the political establishment in the center and right-wing parties, local civil authorities found that they could not actually prosecute against any actions done by the fascists. 
They were able and encouraged to crack down on left-wing violence, but in situations in which this violence was a reaction to fascist violence, it would still be the left's fault. This asymmetrical response then fed back into the system, with those on the left feeling that the local governments were now firmly against them, while the fascist squadist began to feel invincible. This is just one example of the kind of second-hand effects of economic and political leaders that were critical during this period. They were not themselves out in the streets marching, and they may not have even been in open support of fascists, but their official ambivalence had important trickle-down effects at the local level. Fascism continued to grow in power during 1921 and 1922. It was in the spring of that year that serious considerations began to be given to the next step for the movement. These plans would be supported by the fact that fascist power in the north of Italy was almost completely unchecked. But the north was never the final objective, and the eyes began to turn to Rome. The idea of taking more drastic action directly against the central Italian government began to be discussed in April 1922. At this time, the precise type of action was not determined, and the options ranged from a coup d'etat to a more traditional violent revolution, or the eventual outcome, which was the March on Rome. It would not be the first fascist march in Italy, and they played to the strength of the fascist movement. It threatened violence without necessarily committing the movement to violence against the authorities. It displayed the party's strength without seeming a threat to those sectors of society for which they drew their support. Before the March on Rome began, there were discussions that occurred between the fascist leaders revolving around the best way specifically to proceed. They were spurred on by the successful march on the city of Bolzano earlier in the year. On October 24th, the fascist congress would convene in Naples, where further plans were drawn up for what path they were to pursue. But even at this very late stage, just days before the eventual march, the exact nature of this action was not guaranteed. There were other possible options, including the use of fascist connections in the military to cause a military insurrection, which would result in the military and fascists left in control of most of the country, at which point they would have negotiated with Rome. It is important to state that during these months, the situation in Rome was deeply confused and disjointed. In May 1921, Prime Minister Giolitti, who had in many ways been a key player in allowing the fascist violence to spread, called for new elections, which he then lost. And the 1921 elections would see the trend of divisiveness in Italian politics continue. The Italian Socialist Party would take 24.7% of the vote, the People's Party, 20, and the National Bloc, which included the fascists, gained 19. That number was actually a large decrease for the Socialist Party because they'd officially split with the Communists in the months before the elections, which caused a split vote. Giolitti's loss would throw politics into a bit of turmoil for a while, and it would also add him to the list of Italian politicians that were not in the government at the time for the March on Rome, and which Mussolini would meet with and negotiate with. During this period, Mussolini would meet with many politicians, like Giolitti or former Prime Minister Nidi, and he would always discuss the future. In each case, he would convince them that they were an important part of the future fascist coalition that would lead the nation. Even though in most cases, those that met with Mussolini during this period were not active in the current government, they were still in positions to exert influence on events. Eventually, the decision had to be made to actually do something. To, to launch the march. And when that decision was made, it was to be led by four leading fascists, uh, Bianchi, Babo, De Vecchi, and Emilio De Bono. They would set up in Perugia. It would be the meeting point for the fascist marchers. It was roughly 160 kilometers north of Rome. However, many of the planned marchers would not actually arrive at the staging point. Those that did arrive were often poorly armed, equipped, and they were extremely short of food. This resulted in roughly around 5,000 total individuals at the assembly point before the march on Rome began. The weakness of, of this force is important because the march on Rome, spoilers, I guess, would not eventually result in an armed conflict between these men and the authorities, but it was very likely that it would. And so because the numbers were so small and because they were so poorly equipped, that put the fascists in, in a really sort of rough spot if, if this did actually 
come to violence. Now, it wouldn't come to violence, and which is good, because they basically would have been easily handled by the military units around the capital, but that would not happen because of the decisions made by the Italian government. After the march was initiated on October 27th, there was chaos and confusion in Rome as the proper course of action was debated. Critical to this point was the viewpoint of King Victor Emmanuel III. The best way that the government could deal with the advancing fascists was to declare martial law and confront the fascists with the military. After long discussions, this was the path forward agreed to by the political leaders. Prime Minister Luigi Facta thought that this was the plan. However, when he arrived at a meeting with the king at 9 a.m. on the 28th, he found that the crown was now going to refuse to sign the decree to initiate martial law. This moment of refusal by the king was critical, and it seems that he believed that such an action was too radical of a step, and it had too high of a chance of plunging the nation into further violence. The king saw the triumph of the fascisms as likely, and the decision not to enact martial law made it inevitable. Instead of attempting to meet the fascist threats of violence with government-sanctioned violence, the king now had no other option but to acquiesce to the fascist demands, and he would contact Mussolini to begin negotiations. Mussolini had not actually participated in the march. Instead, he'd stayed in a hotel in Milan. He had, of course, taken the time to be photographed with the marchers for propaganda purposes, but the plan was always for Mussolini to stay in Milan to either be contacted by the government or be ready to take the lead in whatever might happen. When he was telephoned by the king, the conversation was probably the best possible outcome for the march. He was offered the position of prime minister with the mandate to form a coalition to lead the government. Mussolini would then take the express train to, from Milan to Rome on the night of the 29th, very pointedly and famously being booked in a normal sleeper compartment. The march on Rome had been a success, and it would be established within the fascist pantheon of heroic events as a great victory for fascism. No one could deny that it succeeded in what it was trying to do, which was to instill a fascist government in Italy. However, this was due almost entirely to the lack of the ability and willingness of the government to react, and the decision of the king not to force the fascists to back down. When the march reached Rome, the city was defended by 12,000 soldiers of the army, and they were led by a general that was loyal to the government and would have followed the martial law decree. The fascist marchers, again just 5,000 of them, had no chance of actually capturing Rome by force or even forcing their way into the city if it came to that. And in fact, they would not even enter the city at all until after Mussolini arrived from Milan. Overall, the march had been a risk. It had depended on the Italian government backing down and not being able to properly respond. And this risk had paid off as well as it possibly could have for Mussolini and the fascists. It was the perfect victory for an early fascist movement. It threatened violence, but their bluff had not been called. And this let them use the story of the march and greatly exaggerate the number of marchers and its overall power that it could have used, while downplaying the failures of the government to respond as one of the primary reasons that it succeeded. The fascists came out of the march looking incredibly strong, without ever having to actually prove that strength in any meaningful way. And now Mussolini was prime minister, the first fascist leader of a nation. In next episode, we will discuss what he would plan to do with that newfound power.